Good history doesn't attempt to judge the past from the present. It seeks to make that past moment come alive. And, and there's no better way to do that than through the window that a still photograph offers. Photographs take us on a journey through the Civil War. The first period in American history that we are able to see almost as if we were there ourselves. Matthew Brady, already well known for his portraits of famous personalities, sent a team of photographers into the field to create a visual record of the Civil War. You can stare through these old photographs into the faces of men who gave up their lives and who risked their lives for uh, causes which they believe passionately. Even with an army of photographers, it was impossible to capture all aspects of war. Of the million or so photographs that it's estimated were taken, there is not one single photograph taken actually, literally, in battle. Because of the long exposure times, because of the huge and cumbersome equipment, because of the obvious danger to the photographers. Although you don't see images of actual battle in course, in some ways, uh, more effective may be the aftermath uh, of battle, the, the broken bodies, the corpses on battlefields. Many of the images were seen in newspapers, giving the American public its first glimpse of the horrors of war in their own homes. The, the country was stunned. Nothing like this had ever been seen in the history of humankind. The New York Times said, if he has not laid the bodies at our doorsteps, I do not know what he has done. There was a sense that for the first time, human beings were faced with the palpable cost of war. From that time on, photography would transform the world for us all. But what were the origins of this powerful medium of communication? This is reputed to be the first photograph, taken in 1827 by a French inventor who stumbled on a compound that was sensitive to light. The blurred view from a window at his house needed an exposure time of eight hours. Clearly, some refinement in the process was needed. The daguerreotype captured its image in a matter of minutes. Although for portraits, the sitter was braced rigidly into place to prevent the photograph from blurring. The oddity of the new process made some people fearful. There are some specific people who put on record uh, their, let's say, uncertainty, if not outright anxiety and fear uh, of the daguerreotype. After all, it was a very uh, complicated process that involved uh, some smelly chemicals. It also involved the appearance and then the disappearance of the photographer uh, as he went into the dark room. Photography uh, looked something like a, an updated version of alchemy. Uh, and there were still some you know, deep-seated superstitions, you might say folk beliefs, uh, which photography uh, uh, trampled upon. The daguerreotype had one major limitation. Each exposure produced a single image that couldn't be copied easily. But English inventor William Henry Fox Talbot solved the problem by fixing images on light-sensitive paper. Copies could then be made by exposing the paper again, much like today's process of negatives and prints. Before the end of the 19th century, George Eastman's development of the role of film put cameras in the hands of the masses. With the memorable slogan, you press the button, we do the rest. Photography was now out of the hands of the alchemists and within reach of ordinary people. Each image creating an instant in history that gives us a more complete relationship to our past. Photographers were quick to realize the impact an image could have on society. Before the end of the 19th century, Jacob Rees was documenting the squalid life of the underprivileged, particularly child laborers. In 1904, an organization was created with the aim of putting an end to abusive child labor practices. The National Child Labor Committee 
was just beginning, and they were beginning to understand the power of photography as a tool to convey a message to people and to convince them about something. And they hired Lewis Hine initially as a freelance photographer in 1906. Hine was charged with documenting the plight of these young laborers and soon went to work for the committee full time. The indignities suffered by these children, some as young as three years old, inflamed Hine's passions, for he himself had been a child laborer. Hine was certainly among the first photographers uh, who learned how to see with a certain kind of formal clarity and directness social information, social scenes. His simple and direct images forced people to confront the immorality of children at work, being denied an education, and their own childhoods. I think Hein wanted the viewer to feel something about these children. And he focused on the children in the situations and thereby drew in his viewer to the child. Hein understood the power of documentary photographs, how the emotions they raised could bring about social change, even if that change was slow. He used the camera as a weapon in the fight against injustice. The eloquent plea for social change captured in the child labor photos echoes in the photos of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Those photographs uh, certainly led to the media coming into the Deep South uh, with their cameras. As the NAACP fought to establish the civil rights movement in the South, they found it virtually impossible to get news to the rest of the country from behind the cotton curtain. The NAACP understood the power of photographs and used them to expose the brutality of the struggle for racial equality. Activist Medgar Ever suffered the most extreme form of brutality. Looking at these photographs, his wife Merle recalls the times. He was the sole spokesperson uh, for his people in the state of Mississippi. Therefore, he became the target. And they thought, if we silence him, we will silence the movement. Photographs that changed social attitudes are strong reminders of their time and place. But the impact of such images can change with the passage of time. By examining old photographs and finding new ways to look at them, it may be possible to look into the eyes of the people pictured and discover an inner truth that speaks from their time to ours. Photographs can document a moment transporting us to other times and places. But can the images tell us more than what is already obvious? There's literally hundreds of ways to look at a still photograph. Even the simplest of ones uh, betrays many, many secrets. But I find that as you extend to the photograph the respect that it's due, it begins to yield up secrets, new stories. For example, if I zoom in, I may find a new tension, a new dimension to what I'm interested in. Photographs introduce us to cultures from the past. They let us celebrate inventive perseverance and get to know the face of scientific success. They invite us to experience the emotions of new immigrants arriving in the land of opportunity. Many of those immigrants would be caught up in the Great Depression of the 1930s. 
It's a period that comes alive to us as a result of a huge photographic archive created by U.S. government agencies in support of President Roosevelt's New Deal. They are now housed at the Library of Congress. It is the largest pictorial collection about United States history that has been compiled to date and probably the largest that will ever be compiled. It is a visual encyclopedia, and it's a visual encyclopedia that's very extensive. There are at least 80,000 prints in the file and nearly 200,000 negatives. The most prolific agency was the Farm Security Administration. Led by Roy Stryker, the photographer's task was to document the everyday lives of ordinary Americans. and publicized the plight of those hardest hit by the Depression. Stryker recruited photographers who shared his philosophy that every person was important and should be treated with dignity. Once in the field, the photographers were left to their own resources. When people were reluctant, the photographers would try to put them at ease. Once the ice was broken, the personality of the subjects often broke through their naturally careworn faces. They posed very stiffly, and I tried to think of what I could do to make them relax a little bit. So I said to Mr. Lyman, Mr. Lyman, I think your pants are falling down. <laughs> <laughs> and they broke up, <laughs> which is just what I wanted. The photographers knew it was impossible to just document American life. They knew that their very presence altered the scene in front of the lens, sometimes in unexpected ways. If you don't know what's behind those pictures, you might think that they're dancing because they're so glad to be in jail or they're so happy, but it's not so. It's because the sheriff told them, ordered them to dance for the photographer. Perhaps the most familiar of the FSA photographs is Migrant Mother, taken by Dorothea Lange in 1936. The 32-year-old mother of seven caught poignantly in Lange's lens was camped at the side of a road in California. She was unable to find work because of a crop failure and unable to move on having sold the tires of her car to buy food. Lange took six pictures of the family but this one image became a symbol of the plight of migrant workers. What is it about her face, her worry, that has drawn a nation to her for generations? Lang's sympathy for people expressed through her lens is also present in the writings of another FSA photographer. Some were poor, so poor they had traveled by foot pushing their young and newborn in buggies and carts. The makeshift shanties dotting the desolate landscapes were built of scrap wood, and the walls were covered with newspapers. I had known poverty firsthand, but there I learned how to fight its evil, along with the evil of racism, with a camera. Like Lewis Hine before him, Gordon Parks used his camera as a weapon to combat social ills in society. He was angered by the racism he encountered, and this anger led to his first and best known FSA photograph. I saw a charwoman, her name was Ella Watson, and she was mopping the floor, she had her brooms on the side. I asked her suddenly, would you pose for me? Would you for a photograph? Me? I asked her to take a broom, one hand and a mop in the other, and the American flag was hanging down from the ceiling. And I posed her in front of it. And from that moment on, I thought of it as American Gothic. <laughs> and uh, I showed it to Roy two days later. And he said, well, you're getting the right idea, but you're going to get us all fired. <laughs> I was just expressing my anger uh, the best way I could through my camera. I realize now, years and years later, that, that the honesty of the picture, the simplicity of it, if you might call it that, uh, 
has made it one of my strongest pictures. During World War II, Stryker, Parks, and the remaining FSA photographers were shifted to the Office of War Information. Their task remained much the same, but Congress began to question whether public money should be spent on something as frivolous as a National Photographic Archive. In the 1940s, Congress was quite upset that federal funds had been squandered taking pictures of things that were this ordinary, this routine. But now, in the 1990s, very few homes look like this. Very few kitchens look like this. And we, as a people, can come back and look at these and say, this is what it was like at that time. This is the way biscuits were made. You don't get them in the freezer section of the grocery in a little tin. Each of the 80,000 photographs in the FSA OWI collection represents an individual story that resonates of a time, a place, and its people. Nature photography can take the viewer to places beyond their normal experience. But as they say, there's more here than meets the eye. To a modern viewer, William Henry Jackson's landscapes in the Yellowstone area of Wyoming give the impression of unspoiled nature. But they served an additional purpose. In 1872, his photographs persuaded Congress to establish the first national park in the U.S. Another pioneer naturalist photographer was Carlton Watkins. His images of the Yosemite area of the Sierra Nevada helped secure the land against development. Uh, they were showing people something that they didn't even know existed, and it gave the people a feeling of what was out here. And I think, uh, you know, those early photographs had a great deal of, co of uh, impact as to some of the decisions that were made in Yellowstone becoming a national park, for instance. To the left, or you want to go this way? Uh, let's stay sort of on this trail here. Okay, get through the I'll cut over. Here in the Colorado Rockies, Wendy Shadow and Bob Rosensky work in the sort of rugged terrain familiar to pioneers like Jackson and Watkins, tracking wildlife in search of what in the photographic process is called the decisive moment. We look for the very special moments, the special kind of light, the special reaction from the animal. Probably the most common question that we get asked of us is, how long did it take you to take that picture? About a five hundredth of a second? <laughs> and 20 years of observation. The more you can know about the animals and the environment and respect it, the better off you're going to be and then the better the pictures will be. And that's probably what separates the professional picture from the average picture. We can share a very special moment that maybe nobody else will ever have a chance in their lifetime to see. I like it when people can have a response to our photographs. Uh, that they react to an image. And the worst thing is if they look at something and say, hmm, that's nice. But when there's some sort of evocative response from a viewer, whether it's a, a moody, foggy shot of a bull elk in a meadow or a baby fox looking up at its mom, when there's a reaction from somebody, I'm thrilled. Today, nature photography adorns the walls of art galleries throughout the world. But can photographs be appreciated as pure art? It was really a long, hard struggle to get the public to accept photography as an art form, because the public, even today, still doesn't like certain things that, or certain subjects that photographers might portray because they feel religious subjects, uh, nudity. They feel that uh, those things are not the domain of photography. The pictorialist movement established in Europe around the turn of the century was determined to secure photography as an art form. The pictorialists strove to make art, and they looked at art as a model for composition, for ideas about form and texture and things along those lines, all the elements of art. They looked at art. 
they didn't imitate so much as they used the elements within art, within photography. It's a new form. In Victorian England, Julia Margaret Cameron, one of the leading pictorialists, was noted for her slightly soft focus, moody portraits that echoed the oil paintings they replaced. In the U.S., avant-garde photographers banded together under the leadership of Alfred Stieglitz. They included Gertrude Kaysbeer, whose work was regularly shown in Stieglitz's New York Gallery alongside other pictorialist photographers and the leading international artists and sculptors of the early 20th century. F. Holland Day, a pictorialist from Boston, shocked turn-of-the-century sensibilities with depictions of male nudes and the seven last words of Christ, a series of photographs in which Day portrays himself on the cross. These are subjects that can still raise eyebrows. The reality of it is that he chose that subject because he deeply believed in it, because he thought it was such a sacred subject, because he thought a painter can use this subject, a photographer as an artist can also deal with this subject. Day's archive of photos came to the Library of Congress in 1934 almost by accident. The 600 pictures accompanied a gift of papers relating to his career as a publisher of artistic books and manuscripts. No information accompanied the pictures, and they have only recently been cataloged, leading to a reappraisal of Day's work. By the middle of this century, artists tried to free themselves from the mechanical limitations of the camera. Man Ray took cameraless photography beyond the simple notion of placing objects on photosensitive paper. These are some pictures made with water smashing down onto photographic paper. Following that tradition, Adam Fuss continues to explore the possibilities of a form of expression that echoes the science and art of the first photographers. I'd been very, very interested in science. About that time, I became more interested in the arts. And photography had one foot in the world of, of science, in, in optics, in mechanics, in chemistry. For me, a successful picture, in a way, is something, when I look at it, when, when I take it out of the tube, I have to keep looking at it. I, I, have, I want to keep looking at it because there's something there that's um, compelling. The interaction between artist and camera defies precise understanding. The techniques adopted by an artist strive to communicate a unity of form in the ideal photograph. And the photograph itself is an interpretation, not necessarily a direct representation of reality. One of the freest forms of photographic expression has been glamour and fashion imagery. Are these images reflecting the values and directions of society, or are they shaping them? Fashion photography is a fascinating niche in photography in that it really can transcend the moment or the object that it has photographed. Um, photographers of fashion photograph the ephemeral and the temporary. And in many cases, these photographs freeze not only a moment, but a real attitude. The fashion industry has made superstars out of models who display its wares. Alongside those famed for their poise on the runway are the fashion photographers, many of whom are as rich and famous as the models they focus on. The work of Herb Ritz defines today's concept of high fashion photography. Every photographer has his own way of going about creating an image. And for me, I like to have my given set up, but I don't plan anything. I like to go for the moment. Okay, just look at me. Look at me. Go smile, head up. Good, good. It's you figuring out in the short time that you have what you want to go for and what best communicates that person's soul. Fashion photography might be considered ephemeral, but the work of one fashion photographer already has a place in the collections of the Library of Congress. 
Tony Frizzell started taking pictures in the early 1930s, and she quickly became a regular contributor to Vogue magazine. Her portraits, of, especially of women, um, have a tenderness uh, and really show the fragility of a woman, uh, but also the strength of a woman at the same time. It's a sort of double-edged sword. She was imaginative and dedicated to her art, often taking her models to exotic outdoor locations. It sets off it's kind of a, a fantasy. Once you get the image, you start thinking, oh, it reminds me of, and then people supply their own meanings to it. She sometimes called it Midsummer Night's Dream, which allows for a lot of imagination on the part of the viewer. She could have remained in the rarefied atmosphere of fashion photography, but during the Second World War, Frizzell switched from fashion to the front line, transforming herself into a photojournalist in bomb-ravaged Europe. You never see the horrors of war. She always tried to look at something, uh, a, a beauty. Even that child sitting in the rubble is a, a beautiful picture. This is from a study she did of a bombing in a neighborhood in London during a blitzkrieg in 1942. All the pictures in there have immediacy to them. In this one, the little boy has sort of a shocked look on his face to know that his family has been killed in the bombing, that his home has been destroyed, that he has only the clothes he's wearing and the stuffed animal. Makes it a very poignant photograph. Among today's documentary photographers, Mary Ellen Mark's images have introduced people to the dispossessed from across the globe. Where I make the images to show people a situation, a condition that exists, and to make them look at it, to force them to look at it. If it's a painful situation, to say you should look at it. Her photographs concentrate on the poor and outcast members of society, ranging from Indian prostitutes to runaways on the streets of Seattle. I suppose I want the people that look at my photographs to, to feel, um, to care about what they're looking at, whether it's, it's laugh or to cry or whatever. I just want them to have those, those feelings, those emotions. However quirky the subject, her images always elicit emotions. A precursor to the documentary camera style was the stereograph. They were an early form of home entertainment that could take people to exotic locations and present the human experience in three dimensions. In the stereograph, two identical pictures viewed together in a simple apparatus gave the impression of a three-dimensional view of the world beyond the living room. No subject was too remote. A series of pictures might show the adventures of an explorer or the downfall of a philanderer. Today, these images have taken on a new meaning as signposts of a journey into our cultural past. Old photographs help us examine societies both primitive and advanced, a visual archaeology. While stereographs were an informative and amusing diversion in their time, today they hold a trove of information about the way things once were. Each image holds evidence of life as it was. It's in the details, the furnishings, clothing, and manners. To truly see, we need only look. Despite obvious danger, Combat cameramen have captured forceful images that document the wars of this century. Their work derives from photos of the American Civil War and Crimean Wars, 
With the advent of aviation, photography offered a whole new perspective on conflict. We try to see whether there are any, uh, not necessarily changes, but just unusual activity. Sophisticated aircraft and satellite surveillance has both civil and military uses, whether monitoring the world's resources or those flyovers that told us about the Cuban Missile Crisis. The image is a tool for us, and it's our research medium, and we have to know how to go in and dig the information out. Any one image will give you um, a bit of information, but putting information into context, overlooking at several images and additional information, you begin to build a, a pattern and a picture. How easy is it to identify significant information from these photographs? It depends. It depends what question you're trying to answer. Some things you can answer very quickly with one image, uh, and often you can look in 20 seconds and immediately know the answer to the question. Other cases, you may have to review literally tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of images, maybe not you personally, but maybe an entire team may have to do that. Hybrids of photographic and computer analysis are redefining the ways things are looked at and seen. One such system can actually identify an anonymous face from within a crowd. People who travel that we're trying to look for around the world frequently change names and all other kind of information associated with them, but they don't change their faces. Even people in disguises, in certain kinds of disguises, can be identified. For example, people who are wearing wigs, sunglasses, uh, people who are wearing trench coats, hats, things like that, we can still make an identification, and we've done testing to make sure that we can. Do photographs always tell the truth? Do they always represent reality? In no cases is a photograph completely reliable, but in all cases, a photograph has the po potential of telling us something about an event, giving us facts, giving us details, giving us all kinds of information that we can stare at, and help us to come to some sort of a conclusion as to what really happened. In today's world of digital technology, desktop computer programs offer anyone the power to alter the basic structure and content of photographs. Which is what computer imaging is mostly about, is you take an image that exists and you change it to illustrate somebody in power's preconception of what the world should be, should be even if it isn't. We are surrounded by photographic images. The camera can act as a sensory extension going where we can't. In medicine, cameras produce visualization techniques that enable diagnosis and treatments impossible just a few years ago. Even now, an electronic camera is under development that takes three-dimensional images that can be manipulated on a computer and viewed from different vantage points. The so-called information superhighway opens up vast possibilities for image transfer and storage, and the Library of Congress is already taking its place on the cutting edge of this new technology with a national digital library. We probably have 12 million photographs here. We feel it's our duty to provide access to those collections. For years we've done it when people come to the reading room. The marvel of the internet and the marvel of the World Wide Web is that it's going to permit us to provide access nationally and internationally to hundreds of thousands of those photographs. Each day students, scholars, and members of the public comb through the archives of the Library of Congress Photography Collection. Here's the material you've requested. What insight from the past just waits to be unearthed from these millions of moments frozen in time? The Prints and Photographs Division of the Library of Congress continues to add to its collection with an eye to what future historians might find interesting. But what we're doing is developing the record, the pictorial record, the visual record of American history for our descendants to document the history, the achievement, and experience of the American peoples. Collections like the Library of Congress have so many pictures which um, epitomize a people, a time, a culture, knowledge that we don't really get in reading, but that is captured in the frame of a photograph.